All right. So what I'm going to do tonight is expand on a few of the things that Pastor Dave actually just gave during the introduction. And what I want to start with is just to say something that you've already heard tonight, which, or not tonight, but you've been hearing for several weeks now, which is that on November 3rd, we are going to be having the most important decision, the most important meeting, really, that's happened at Faith Church for over 50 years. The only thing I could think of that was maybe more important was the initial decision to start this church when Paul Augenbaugh planted the church over 50 years ago. But now we're at a new decision point, and that's going to be made on November 3rd. And that decision is whether to leave the PCUSA and to go to a new denomination, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, which I'll say more about in just a few minutes. Well, let me say a couple points. First of all, how did we get to this place? How did we get to this place? Just to re- by way of review, and many of you already know this, uh, we've been in this process officially for over a year. So uh, in uh, July of 2012, the session voted to seek dismissal, uh, voted to officially enter this process to be asked to be dismissed from the Presbyterian Church and voted unanimously to do that. Our elders did. And then the next month, a committee from Presbytery attended the session meeting to see how serious we were about this. They found out we were very serious about it. And so um, they continued that process to uh, understand where we were. But we sent a letter to every member in the congregation in September of 2012 letting you know about this decision that the session made. Then in October... Uh, A visitation team from the Presbytery came to meet with us, and they met with another team from our congregation to sort all of these next steps out. We appointed that team from our session, and then they met during uh, the next month to figure out what the next steps were. Then in December, uh, at the end of, well, the end of November and the beginning of December, we had some forums, and the purpose of those forums was to get a pulse for uh, the general thoughts about for the congregation, that the congregation had about these matters. How many people here were, went to those forums last, at the end of last year? Okay, the majority of you were, were here for that. So those forums happened, and then after the forums, the visitation team and our team from this church met, and they concluded that it was God's will for us to continue down this process, that it wasn't just the session, but it was the large majority of the people of this church who really felt like this was the direction that we needed to head. So that was you all speaking loud and clear during that time. In February, they presented this uh, report to the presbytery, and they approved that. And then they appointed what was called an administrative commission, which is the group from presbytery that would uh, oversee the rest of this process. And they've been meeting for several months. In August, um, they approved a motion at the presbytery meeting to allow us to call what's going to be called a congregational hearing on November 3rd to officially vote on whether we are going to indeed leave the PCUSA to join another denomination. So that's what brought us to this point. Now, how did we get here? The next question then that some people are still having some questions about is why did we get here? Why is it that we are leaving? Um, And just to give you a summary of this, and this is something Pastor Dave referenced in his introduction, the summary is that the PCUSA, the denomination which we're a part of, has been moving away from biblical orthodox reform teaching for more than 30 years. And we can no longer in good conscience be affiliated with a denomination that has fundamentally different values from our congregation. Faith Church hasn't changed what we've taught over the years. Those of you who've been here many years know that we've really stayed true to what we believe and what we teach, and we haven't changed. What's changed is the denomination has been drifting in a different direction for at least 30 years. This isn't something that happened overnight. This is something that's been happening for a long, long time, and it's gotten to the place where we feel we can't be affiliated with a group any longer that's in such a different place from what our mission and vision and values are here at our church. Now, let me give you some specific issues to explain what I mean here. And some of you have heard some about this already, but I'll give you some more specific information tonight. Specific issues that kind of of hash this out. Um, First of all, the lordship of Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. This church, for those of you who have been here for any length of time, know that this congregation is a Christ-centered congregation. We value Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Not just the Savior of the people in this room, or the people who are on our membership rules, or the people who are in Seminole, or the people who are in uh, the United States, but the entire world. That Jesus came, not just to be a good teacher or a guy who gives good advice, but he came to be the Savior of the world. We believe that, and we believe that strongly. 
Unfortunately, the PCUSA has moved in a direction where many leaders and many churches no longer affirm anymore that Jesus is the one true Savior. Many of them would affirm something very different, that all paths lead to the same place, or that Jesus is just one among many valid options or beliefs, and that it doesn't really matter what you believe. Um, they do statistics and, and surveys uh, every couple of years to survey what people think about these issues in the denomination. And in the most recent Presbyterian panel, 56% uh, of all people in the denomination agreed with the statement that all, world's religion, all the world's religions are equally good ways of helping a person find ultimate truth. More than half of the people in our denomination would affirm that. Only 41% of ministers, so that's less than half, believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. So this is a very, very serious thing. That less than half of our leadership is, a, is willing to affirm that Jesus is the, the only Savior. And that's a very basic biblical belief. Uh, but we see this all over the place within the denomination. We see this at the General Assembly, which is our largest gathering of leaders that happens every other year. In 2008, the General Assembly said they affirmed the theological idea that Muslims, Christians, and Jews all worshiped a common God and that we should celebrate religious holidays together. So essentially saying all religions basically are the same thing. Um, we've seen changes to our book of order, which is one half of our constitution. We have two parts of our constitution in the denomination. The first part is our book of confessions. The second part is our book of order, which is the governing rules for the church. We've seen changes to the book of order. The old book of order used to say, the church universal consists of persons in every nation together with their children who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's a great statement there. The new book of order in the New Book of Order, the words profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior were taken out. So, in other words, then what all it says is the church universal consists of persons in every nation. Who knows whether they have to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior or not? It doesn't say. Jesus is not affirmed there as Savior. Not in any clear sense. The Old Book of Order says the church is called to present the claims of Christ leading persons to repentance and acceptance of him as Lord and Savior. In the New Book of Order, the words, leading persons to repentance and acceptance of him as Lord and Savior, were taken out. In other words, I guess we present the claims of Christ, but it's not clear whether someone has to repent and accept Christ as Savior in order to be saved. It's just not there. It's not clear. Jesus is just less and less affirmed as the necessary Savior for every person on the planet. We had an example of this, a very clear example of this, uh, at a presbytery meeting that happened in this very sanctuary a couple of years ago. Uh, we, church, various churches host the presbytery meetings throughout the year. We hosted a presbytery meeting uh, just a couple of years ago. And one of the things that came up at that presbytery meeting was there was a minister. Actually, this person hadn't, wasn't fully a minister yet, but they were being examined at the presbytery meeting um, in order to be approved to become ordained and to have a position in our presbytery. And when this person came up, there were some very unclear things theologically. And so myself and Pastor Dave and a few others uh, asked this person some questions to see whether they believed what the scriptures really teach. And one of the basic things that was asked to this person was, do you affirm that Jesus Christ is the only Savior? And can someone be saved apart from believing in Jesus Christ? Now that seems like a pretty simple question, doesn't it? <laughs> Do you believe Jesus Christ is the only Savior? I mean, to me, that's just a yes or no. That's not really, you don't have to really talk a long time to answer that one. But this person could not affirm that. Couldn't affirm that very basic question. Now, here's the depressing part. That's bad enough. What's even worse is that our presbytery at that meeting went on to approve the person for ministry by wide margins. So it's no problem to have this person ordained and, and leading people in our, in our presbytery, even though they clearly don't affirm Jesus as Savior and basically believe that all religions lead to the same place. Let's go to another issue, the authority and the infallibility of Scripture. You know, really what you could say is that the root problem in our denomination that has led to many of the other problems is the erosion of our idea of Scripture. If you have a warped view of Scripture— then everything else that you believe is going to be warped because the way you view the scriptures will determine all those other beliefs. So you might say that scripture is the root 
Um, and it's the foundation. If that foundation is messed up, then everything else begins to get messed up. And so I think in this way, uh, our, our, our erosion of the authority of Scripture is the, the root cause of many of our problems. But when you ask many leaders in our denomination uh, what their view of Scripture is, they no longer believe that Scripture has a unified witness about important theological issues. They'll say, well, simply, Scripture has many interpretations, and who's to say what Scripture says about this particular issue or that particular moral issue? We don't know because there's, vari- there's an op- a variety of interpretations that it's open to. One of the interesting things is in our um, book of uh, order, one of the things that you have to affirm if you're going to be a pastor or an elder or a deacon when you take ordination vows is, do you affirm the essential tenets of the Reformed faith? Do you affirm the essential tenets of the Reformed faith? In other words, you're being asked, do you believe and affirm the sort of key theological doctrines that are central to the Bible? And they call those the essential tenets of the Reformed faith. Well, the problem is, we're asked to affirm that in the Book of Order, but we don't have written down anywhere what the essential tenets are. It's not written anywhere. And so, and, and actually, if you talk to many leaders in the denomination, they'll say, we don't want any essential tenets because we don't want to say one belief is better than another. And so the only essential left in the PCUSA is that there are no essentials. <laughs> That's the only essential, is that there are no essentials. We don't want to be a church with essentials, is what the denomination said loud and clear. Well, we at Faith Church would like to be part of a body that says we do have some essential beliefs that are are important to the Christian faith. There's changes here to the Book of Order as well. The Book of Order used to say that those who were called to office were required to live in obedience to Scripture. And just a few years back, there was a change made to the Book of Order that which removed the phrase obedience to Scripture. It used to say, that, th- that those who are called to office, pastor, elder, deacon, are required to live in obedience to Scripture. Now that's been taken out, and it simply says, ordaining bodies are called to be guided by Scripture when they choose candidates. Now I want you to see the difference between an authority that you have to be obedient to and a guide. You know, when you take a guidebook on vacation, you don't consult it as if it's commanding you to go to these places, do you? It's just a list of ideas of places to visit. That's what a guidebook is. An authority is something that you have to obey because there are serious consequences if you don't. But we've moved from a, a denomination that sees Scripture as an authority to Scripture's become sort of a guidebook. Well, I'll take or leave what I like. I, what I don't like, yeah, I'll just leave that out. That's what Scripture in many ways has become in our denomination. When, when this change was made to the book of order and that that phrase about leaders needing to be obedient to scripture was removed there were many people like like the people of faith church who thought that was a a bad thing that that was removed from the book of order that we shouldn't be making changes like that we should be say loud and clear that our leaders are called to be obedient to scripture and so someone put forward a resolution at the general assembly that said let's put that language back in about leaders needing to be obedient to Scripture. And so they put that forward for a vote. Let's put that language back in. That resolution failed four to one. In other words, 75% of the people voting at the General Assembly said, we don't want the language to be in the Book of Order about leaders being, need, be, needing to be obedient to Scripture. Isn't that just mind-boggling? That doesn't seem like it should be controversial at all. And yet, here we are, at a place where scripture is no longer authority, at best, it's just a useful guide that we can take or leave with whatever points it makes. A third area here, the call to obedience and holy living. This is an important issue in the Christian faith because as Christians, we believe that being a Christian is not just about affirming some things with your mouth, but it's also about the way we live. You know, Jesus said in the scriptures, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what did he mean by that? He wasn't talking about works righteousness or that you do good works and you get into heaven. He was saying that you can't just say a few words with your mouth and then go live however you want and expect that that you, you, you make it into heaven. He said that a real true profession of faith, if you really receive Christ into your life and are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you'll begin to live a changed life and there's fruit that is born from that as the result of Christ changing us. And therefore, 
uh, the Christian life is about an, a call to obedience and holy living, not by our own power, but by the power that Christ gives us. This has become a very difficult issue in the PCUSA because of the way this plays into uh, the way we understand leadership standards. Now, let me back up for a minute and say that at Faith Church, we have a specific uh, understanding of how, what our expectations are for the way that people are involved in our community. If you want to just attend Faith Church, come to worship services, be part of activities that go on on our campus, we welcome everybody to come here and be part of those. You could be a Christian, you could be a non-Christian. Maybe you're not sure whether you believe in Christ. You could be struggling um, with, with a background of very difficult issues, or maybe you don't have a difficult background. Maybe you're struggling with some really big and difficult sins in your life, and maybe you're not. We welcome everybody to come to this church to worship, to be part of activities that go on here. You can be, wherever you are in your life, you're welcome to come. Now, if you want to become a member at Faith Church, well, that's a little bit different. That's a different category. Because if you want to become a member, you have to affirm some basic theological affirmations. And the primary one is that you have to affirm that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and that you have received him into your life. And you have to make a statement of faith before the session. So in order to move from just being an attender of the church or activities, if you want to become a member, we do require that you have a, uh, an affirmation of Christian faith. And that's a different category. That's what unites us together as members rather than just necessarily attenders. Now, let's take it one step further to a third category. What about leadership? Well, leaders in the church are required to go a, a step further. And leaders are required to exhibit a sound faith, in other words, teaching that's consistent with the Scripture and beliefs that are consistent with Scripture, but also sound moral character. If someone's living a lifestyle that is wholly contradictory to what the Scriptures teach, then that would disqualify them for leadership because we recognize that our leaders are the ones who set an example for others, and leaders, in, according to the Scriptures, are called to a higher standard. Well, this is where we've run into some major problems in the denomination in recent years because in many ways the denomination has turned this around and has removed biblical standards for leadership from the book of order. The book of order used to say, as many of you know, that those who are called to leadership, those who are called to ordained office, whether it's a pastor, whether it's an elder, whether it's a deacon, those, those categories especially were called to a higher standard, and specifically, they were called to a higher standard with regard to their sexual lives, that they had to live either within the fidelity of, of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman, faithful marriage, can't be out, you know, messing around outside of marriage, either in the fidelity of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman, or chastity and singleness, which means purity and singleness, can't be, you know, out living a promiscuous lifestyle, having sex outside of marriage, those sexual standards were taken seriously for leaders. That phrase that leaders must either live within the fidelity of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman or chastity and singleness was removed from the book of order is no longer a standard in our church. And therefore, the church it, it will now ordain leaders and is open to in many different presbyteries who don't live within the fidelity of the covenant of marriage between a man and woman or chastity and singleness. Now, I want you to recognize this opens up the door for lots of different, different issues. The one that always gets the most attention in the media and in church discussions is gay ordination. And I want you to first of all recognize that although the issue of gay ordination is the one that gets the most attention, in some ways that's not the root problem. It's a problem that is a symptom of a larger problem. You, you saw these issues tonight. This isn't just a, an issue about gay ordination. We've got some major issues that we can't even affirm who Jesus Christ is and that he's the only Savior or the authority of Scripture. And those are really the foundational problems that lead to all these other problems that we have in the church. So I want you to first understand that that's not the uh, primary issue. In some ways, it's a secondary issue, but it comes out of these other issues that we're facing. I also want to emphasize that by removing that standard from the book of order, that doesn't just create problems in terms of gay ordination, but it creates other problems as well. There's no standard that says now that uh, those who are having sex outside of marriage heterosexually can't be ordained. 
Apparently anything goes when it comes to sex because we don't want to have any standards in terms of holy living when it comes to our leaders. And we are now in a denomination where those uh, ordinations are taking place. Let me go to one more category here, and that's confessional authority has been jettisoned. I talked about this a little bit already, and Pastor Dave mentioned this in the introduction, but uh, we have, as Pastor Dave used that analogy, two great anchors for the church. The one anchor is the scriptures, and that's the primary anchor that leads us and guides us and tells us what we're to believe and how we're to organize our church. But the second anchor is our confessions, and our, our book of confessions is a, a, a set of theological statements that helps us understand how we interpret the scriptures and what our theological beliefs are. Well, that, as well as scripture, has uh, basically been ignored in the church, and there was an interesting point at the last General Assembly um, which really uh, illustrated this situation very well. And what, what happened at the last General Assembly is one of the things that they were discussing at the last General Assembly was not just the issue of gay ordination, but the issue of gay marriage as well. And whether or not Presbyterian churches um, should uh, bless gay marriages, have gay, mar gay uh, weddings in, in the sanctuaries and, and ministers performing those things. And that issue was brought up as to whether to change our book of order to approve of that. And interestingly enough, someone got up and asked what was a very, very telling question at the time. And what he did was he got, a, uh, this man got up, who was a very smart man in our denomination, and he said, he said, Help me to explain this here. Help me to understand this here. Because I see a major contradiction. And here's the contradiction. We have two parts to our constitution in the Presbyterian Church. The first part, as I said, is the book of confessions, which is our theological statements. The second part is the book of order, which is those governing uh, documents, which tell us how we're governed and how we're organized. He said, our confessional statements clearly affirm the biblical defini definition of marriage as between a man and a woman. And here we are voting on whether to amend the book of order, the second part, to affirm gay marriage in this denomination. And so we're amending, we're, we're asking the question of whether to amend the second part of the Constitution in a way that's wholly contradictory to the first part of a Constitution. So he was asking the question, how can you amend one part of a Constitution to contradict another part of a Constitution? It would be like adding an amendment to the United States Constitution that totally said the opposite of an amendment that you made earlier. It would be total nonsense. So they kind of hemmed and hawed over this question. Eventually, they invited somebody forward who is supposedly an expert in these constitutional matters and asked him to give his opinion. And he got up and he basically said, well, you know, it doesn't really matter because the confessions are open to a variety of interpretations and who's to say one's better than the other. And they don't really have to agree. We can adopt one idea that's not consistent with another part because who really, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. And that's basically reflective of the larger attitude in our denomination. We no longer take seriously the confessions. We no longer really take seriously the authority of Scripture. And both anchors have been pulled out. And the ship is just floating to a direction. Who knows where the ship is floating? We don't really know what, where it's going now, but it's not good. That gives you a little bit idea of why we have come to the place that we have. Now, somebody might say in response to this, well, Stephen, that's an interesting case you've made, but why do we still need to leave? Why can't we just do our thing and let the presbytery and the denomination do their thing? We can just ignore them over there. Why do we care what they think? Why do we care what they do? We can do our own thing and we could just ignore them. Why not take that approach? Well, the reason why that's not really a viable approach is because our affiliation has many practical implications that will affect the life of our church, whether we just ignore them or we don't. And let me just give you a few. First of all, to back up again, uh, uh, to reiterate what Pastor Dave said, he said, in some ways you might say that the, uh, we aren't leaving the PCUSA, the PCUSA has left us. We're seeking a new denominational home that reflects the beliefs and values we have always taught at Faith Church. I think that's a good way of understanding it. But why not just ignore what's going on and do our own thing? Well, the PCUSA impedes our ministry 
in a number of different ways. And I'll give you uh, uh, just a few here. First of all, it impedes our fruitfulness. The fact that we have to spend time on these things year after year because of our interactions with the General Assembly and the Presbytery, it impedes our fruitfulness. We'd rather be focusing on other issues and other ministries that are a better use of our time. Secondly, though, it impedes our future leadership. There are no longer any evangelical seminaries in the Presbyterian Church. And anyone who wants to be ordained in the Presbyterian Church has to go to one of the Presbyterian seminaries. But none of them teach or train leaders in the same beliefs that we believe here at Faith Church. So what does that result in? Well, it results in a crop of future leaders that won't uh, teach or preach things that are consistent with what this church has, has always believed. And you also have to understand, not only will those leaders be fewer and fewer, but the leaders that you elect for your church have to be approved by the presbytery. So someday when Pastor Dave and I are long gone from here and you guys are searching for new pastors, whatever that process looks like, you will have to form a search committee and then choose a pastor, and then the presbytery has to approve that pastor. I, didn't know, I don't know if you realize that, but the presbytery has to approve it. And the, you could want somebody for this church who you think this is the right person for faith church and they fit our beliefs and values, and the presbytery could say, well, sorry, you can't have them because we don't like their beliefs. And that's happening all over the country already as more evangelical leaders are being denied positions in presbyteries because the presbyteries are essentially shutting them out. So it affects our future leadership. It impedes our witness as well. When other churches and leaders in our denomination teach something that's different than what we teach, then that affects our witness because people look at that and they say, well, this church here teaches this, so you must believe that as well. And therefore, it impedes our witness. It also impedes our resources. Uh, many people, they t tend to think of the resources in terms of, well, we have to give per capita to the denomination, and that's a drain on our resources. We'd rather not do that. Well, if you think about it, per capita wouldn't be such a bad thing if we were giving to a, a cause that we agreed with. If we were giving to a denomination that we were fully in support of, we, I wouldn't think that was such a bad thing. I'd think my money was going to a good place. But we don't like the fact that the denomination's heading in that direction. And it doesn't just impede our resources that way, but we have also lost members over the last uh, at least 10 years or more who have no longer been part of Faith Church because uh, they don't want to be affiliated with the PCUSA. And that's continued to happen as well. It impedes our clarity. This is similar to something I already said, but when the denomination teaches one thing and we teach another, it sends a confusing message to the culture. And it sends a confusing message to the people that we're trying to reach with the gospel and with what the Bible teaches. And then it also impedes our partnerships. Um, other evangelical churches and leaders and organizations and parachurch groups and all of these things are more wary to partner with churches that are in mainline denominations like the PCUSA because they no longer reflect the same shared beliefs. The PCUSA has lost mission partnerships over this. There have been large international Presbyterian bodies like the, the Presbyterian Church of um, Mexico and the Presbyterian Church of Ghana and, and others as well who have cut ties with the PCUSA. They've said, we will no longer partner with you and we're cutting ties with you because of the direction that you have headed. So mission partnerships are, are dissolving and domestic partnerships are being strained as well. So it impedes our partnerships. What I hope you see there is that when you ask the question of why not just stay and ignore what they're doing over there, it's not really a feasible option because even if you just sat and ignored what was going on, whether you liked it or not, our ministry would be impeded in a whole host of different ways simply by remaining affiliated with the denomination. Let me say a word about the question, where are we going then? If we're leaving the PCUSA, where are we going? Well, uh, we are going, the session has considered this uh, very seriously and have decided that the Evangelical Presbyterian Church is a place that is much more consistent with our beliefs and our vision and our values at Faith Church. I want to emphasize here that some people have wondered, well, if we're, not, if we're leaving the PCUSA, does that mean we're not going to be a Presbyterian church anymore? The answer to that is no. 
we are still going to be a Presbyterian church. In fact, the EPC is far more Presbyterian at this point than the PCUSA because the PCUSA has abandoned its roots so radically that it's hard to even consider them Presbyterian anymore. When you abandon what it means to be Presbyterian, the EPC is another Presbyterian body that much more uh, fits with what we believe and what we value at this church. We're not, in some ways, we're not moving in a new direction at all. We're seeking to remain faithful to what we've always taught and believed at Faith Church. The EPC uh, was founded in 1982. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the EPC, but I'll just give you a few points here. They founded in 1982 um, and have around 500 congregations right now across the country. Um, there's some information as you leave tonight. There's three actual pamphlets and information about the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. It's on a table in the narthex, and as you leave, you can take those um, and gives you more information about the EPC. In one of those, it's out of date. It actually says there are 300 congregations. It's around 500 now because um, in recent years, so many more churches have been joining the EPC um, because of the issues going around in our denomination that it's much higher than that. Um, Around 500 congregations, and um, they're Reformed, and they're Evangelical, they're a Biblical denomination. Um, all of those terms, we could probably talk for a whole hour about what each of those means, but simply, to put it simply, they're Reformed denomination in the sense that they stand in the Reformation tradition and the key Reformation doctrines that we hold dear at this church. They're evangelical, they're committed to the gospel and the idea that Jesus Christ is the Savior and that we want to share him with everyone in, uh, across the globe. And they're biblical, they're committed to the scriptures. Um, they use the Westminster Standards. The Westminster Confession of Faith is their one confession. Um, we in the PCUSA have a book of confessions, which is several different theological statements. And one of those is the Westminster Confession. Um, so in some ways, there's no change here. It's just that we're moving from, instead of using several, only using Westminster Confession, because, uh, and the reason they've done that is because it brings more theological clarity to uh, their, confession, their uh, confessional statements. Um, and then their motto is, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. That's a great motto, and I want to tell you why I think that's a great motto. Because it says, in essentials, there should be unity. In the essential teachings of the faith, there should be unity and not disagreement. On Is Jesus Christ the Savior? Is the Scripture infallible? On all these things, there should be unity. We shouldn't disagree about those things. There shouldn't be discussion or argument about those things because they're the core issues of the faith. But in non-essentials, we can have liberty. In, in smaller theological issues that aren't central to the faith, we can have flexibility and we can have liberty. And then in all things, uh, we want to be charitable and loving towards one another. Details about the hearing. This is coming up on November 3rd, and it's going to be at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the format is going to be, uh, the meeting is going to be after simultaneous 10 o'clock a.m. worship services. Both services will take place at the same time at 10 o'clock. The traditional service will be in here. The contemporary service will be in the Faith Center. They will both take place at 10 o'clock. They will both end at 11, and the meeting will happen immediately um, after the services. Okay? That way, everyone will be on campus at the same time, and everyone will go to the meeting together. Um, only active members may vote. That means you have to be a member on the rolls of the church if you're going to vote. Um, unfortunately, just attending the church doesn't qualify you to vote. 50% of our total membership must attend. That means about 350. We have around 700 on the rolls. So about 350 members must be present to vote. If 349 show up, we can't vote. I want you to hear that very clearly tonight. Every person needs to be here. If we are even one short, we don't get to vote. And this is a one-time shot. We don't get to, it's, it's not going to be a situation where you say, well, we didn't quite make it, so we'll schedule a second meeting in a few months. Not going to happen. They give us one chance. 50% must attend, and then of that number of however many show up, 75% of those voting must